Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second live stream uh, organized in the framework of the Dutch Design Week. It is my pleasure to introduce you the creative um, industries coach, David Parrish, who will, uh, will present the session, the minimum viable product for innovative diversification. He will introduce one of the most important methodologies of lean diversification, the minimum viable product, a cheap and fast method to test market, learn and adapt. The business expert will present the diversification matrix as a feasible tool um, if you seek to test new markets, segments and niches. I would like also to make a short introduction of your uh, vast expertise, if I may. And welcome. <laughs> David is an experienced business advisor, management consultant, um, and marketing expert, specializing in helping businesses and organizations in the creative and digital industries. He works internationally and advises clients on business growth, managing change, strategic marketing, leadership, intellectual property, and intellectual, uh, international business. He is um, um, a marketing expert and an author in the same time. His latest book on strategic marketing is Chase One Rabbit, Strategic Marketing for Business Success, 63 Tips, Techniques, uh, and Tips for Creative Entrepreneurs. David is also the author of the highly acclaimed book, T-Shirts and Suits, A Guide to the Business of Creativity, and uh, has set up and managed enterprises in the creative industry throughout his career as an entrepreneur. He works independently with clients as a management consultant, coach, and trainer. He also works through business support organizations and enterprise agencies in the UK and worldwide. As a trainer, he designed and delivered uh, interactive workshops on strategic marketing, prices, pricing, and business growth, and also as a, as a keynote speaker on marketing and business at conferences and creative industries and events worldwide. In addition to his professional accreditations in marketing, his credentials include being a member of the Institute of Consulting, a fellow uh, of the Institute of Leadership and Management, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Art. So David, welcome to, to the live stream, and we are looking forward to hear your insightful uh, tips. Well, thank you. Ben for the kind introduction, um, very good of you. And I'm delighted to be here uh, with you to, to talk about the minimum viable product and innovative diversification. Um, I'm also looking forward to a dialogue with all of you so that um, we can discuss these issues, I can answer questions, and I can learn from you and your experiences. So I'll be speaking for about 40 minutes and then we have plenty of time for questions and you can put those in the chat and we can have a discussion. So um, what am I going to talk about? Let me give you an overview of, um, of my presentation. First of all, um, what do we mean by diversification? So I'm going to discuss different definitions of that um, from ANSOF to COVID, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, then when we have various ideas from, um, about diversification, we can use the feasibility filter to decide which ones are the best ones to pursue because we can't do everything that we have an idea about. And then thirdly, the minimum viable product or MVP um, as a particular technique for rolling out and developing into the market these new innovations. So that's the overview uh, of my presentation. But first of all, I think we need uh, some context because if we're talking about innovation and creativity, what exactly do we mean by creativity? And in my TEDx talk at TEDx Napoli, I said that the word of creativity is a problem because it usually means only artistic creativity. So I proposed in that TEDx talk, which is on my website, by the way, um, that we have two words. The word A, creativity, using the letter A, meaning artistic creativity, and a second 
term I creativity using the letter I, meaning ingenuity, the ingenious creativity that we find in all fields of human endeavor. So although we can be creative in the studio with our fashion designs, with uh, other designs, with music and literature, publishing, video, etc., we can also be creative uh, in the way that we do business in our business models. And I talked about that in Valencia with the Worth Partnership Project, um, and that's also on my website. So we need to be clear about um, what we mean by creativity, and we can be creative in all kinds of ways, not just in the studio, but in the way that we develop our businesses, indeed through diversification and our business models. So I talk about bringing together uh, creative talent and smart business thinking. And as was mentioned in, my, in the presentation, the introduction, my book is called uh, T-Shirts and Suits, A Guide to the Business of Creativity. That's available, um, it's published in 14 countries in translations. In English, the book is available free as an ebook from my website, so you can download it. And you might ask why I give it away for free. And that's because it's part of a, a creative business model called freemium, where I give some things away for free in order to earn more money elsewhere later. So we can be creative um, with our business models. And I also talk about designing your creative business and that's a toolkit publication, which I wrote and published, and that's available on my website. And there are some special offers on my website to get to that. So these are just some things that are um, relevant to this presentation about the minimum viable product and innovative diversification, because we have to talk about um, what we mean by innovation and creativity. So let me then proceed um, and talk about the, um, the word diversification, because it means different things. And when we started talking during COVID and the lockdown, about diversifying, we could see that many businesses in all sectors of the economy were starting to diversify. Um, we had manufacturers of vacuum cleaners who were then making respirators for hospitals. We had uh, manufacturers in, uh, in clothing and fashion design switching their production to masks and gowns for hospitals. So we talked about diversification in a very broad way, but it reminded me of something I learned about at business school, um, which was about Ansoff's matrix. So I'm gonna talk you through that because I think it's very helpful and very relevant to what we can do in the creative industries, in fashion and other kinds of design for uh, to diversify and to find new opportunities in the market um, at this particular time of crisis. So I'm going to talk you through Ansoff's matrix. Now, Iger Ansoff wrote a book about business development. And this, is, this diagram is derived from that book and in many ways encapsulates the, the essence of the book. So he says that there are four ways that we can develop a business. The first one in the green square is market penetration. And this is selling existing products to existing markets. It's not really changing anything, but just doing more of the same, digging deeper into the market to sell more of our existing products to existing customers and markets. And that's an option, of course. Then number two is product development, where we stay with our existing customers and markets, but we offer new products for them. So you can see that we're moving into new products, but still with existing markets. 
and that's product development number two in the blue. A third option is market development, which is to find new customers for our existing products. So we're only changing one thing. We're staying with our products, but finding new markets for them. And that's an option. Number three, market development. And then number four is diversification. And this has a special meaning with Ansoff um, because he's talking here about simultaneously having new products and new markets. So number four is in red in my diagram because I think it, it indicates danger because diversification in the way he means it is about changing two things at once, going into two levels of unknown because we're dealing with new products and new markets, which uh, is double the risk because we have two factors that are changing. But of course we can go there in two stages, like a board game, instead of moving across from number one to number four, we can move from one to two and then to four or from one to three and then to four. So I think Ansoff's matrix is a very good, um, very good diagram in order to map out and to discuss with colleagues the different options that we have. Shall we focus on new products or new markets? Shall we do both at the same time? And it's, I think it's a very useful framework for discussing the possibilities. And so I offer it to you and it's on my website, on the page I've put in the link, you can find more details of this and more explanation. But when I looked at this, I thought that it was a bit out of date because uh, Ansoff wrote about diversification in the last century. And it seems to me that many things have changed in this century because of the internet mainly um, and all kinds of digital options become available. So I've taken the liberty of building on Ansoff's matrix and creating my own COVID-19 diversification matrix, which again, I will talk you through. And you can see that much of it is the same. The four squares, number one, two, three, and four, are the same as Ansoff's matrix. But in the middle of it all, in the middle of this whole situation, and in the middle of all our options for business development, are digital versions and online channels. So as we develop products, we can adapt existing products into digital versions. This is something I've done with my books. So a book that starts off as a paperback can become an ebook and an audio book. So we're creating new um, products or shall we say adapted products. And this goes into the, the mix of options that we have. And then we have online channels for distribution. So we can reach new markets through social media. Uh, we can distribute our uh, products uh, online through YouTube, through other means. And so I think that instead of there being just four options, there are many more. And I deliberately didn't put uh, arrows on this diagram because there would be too many of them uh, and they would kind of spoil the, the diagram. There would be uh, at least 10 or possibly 12 different ways we can diversify. So, the point of this diagram is to help us think through all the different options we have, because sometimes as creative people, we have more ideas than we can possibly deliver. Uh, we can't do everything, and we need therefore to be rational about how we develop our businesses uh, at a time of COVID, at any time actually, but particularly at a time of crisis. And this diagram helps us to think through, to uh, discover different options, and then to somehow prioritize them. And that's the next point we need to come to, which is about the feasibility filter. And the point is that we have more options than we can deliver. We have limited amount of 
resources in terms of money and time and people and energy. So we have to focus on those things that are the most valid, the most realistic. So out of all the different ideas that we have, we have to prioritize. And I created something that I call the feasibility filter, which is actually published in my book, uh, T-Shirts and Suits, A Guide to the Business of Creativity. But I'll talk about it now. And the diagram has two dimensions to it. Um, the first diagram going, uh, the first line going upwards is about um, competitive creativity. In other words, out of all the options, which are the ones that are most competitive in the marketplace? Where do we have competitive advantage, which is a key element of our business formula? So if some, some new innovation or diversified uh, option um, gives us competitive advantage, then it should score highly and we would put it on the diagram high up. The other uh, dimension across the bottom is market suitability. And there we're talking really about uh, profitability or if we are a social enterprise, we might say how it fits with our objectives. So whatever our objectives are, does it deliver? And for many businesses, of course, it's about money and profit. So we can put on the, on the diagram all the various options. And so you can see that the green and the red and the three yellow dots are, the, are different ideas that we can map onto the feasibility filter in order to decide which ones to progress with. And at the bottom left, uh, A is in the red, is an idea which is a good idea, but we don't have competitive advantage and it's not very profitable. So that's why it's down at the bottom left. And we're not going to pursue that one because we have better options. Scattered across the diagram are three yellow um, dots, which um, represent other ideas that we might have. And then at the top right in green is an idea that has competitive um, creativity and competitive advantage. It is also very suitable for the market because we can make profits from it. So that's why we would choose the one in green, B in the diagram. So again, the feasibility filter is a way of assessing the different ideas we have. So when we're working with our teams, with our colleagues, when we're thinking even on our own, I, I suggest we have two stages of innovation and creativity. The first is to think of lots of ideas. And there we must be free to think of any crazy idea without evaluation. And secondly, the second stage is to filter and to sort and select from all these many ideas, um, the ones that can logically and rationally be put into practice and the ones we should then develop for our business. So it's, we need to use our right brain for creativity and our left brain for um, analysis. And this is something that often goes wrong actually in, um, in team meetings. And I'm sure you've all been there when the team leader says, does anybody have any ideas? And somebody proposes an idea and then somebody else criticizes it. And so we cancel each other out. And this is a bad way to have a, a brainstorming or an ideas session. What I propose and what I do in my workshops when I'm working with businesses is to have two separate sessions. The first is to think of ideas, including crazy ideas. It doesn't matter. We just have lots of fun thinking very freely and create maybe a hundred ideas that we write down on, on post-it notes or something. And at this point, we don't criticize, we don't evaluate, we just have fun thinking up all kinds of ideas. And then we take a coffee and a short break, and then we come back using our left brain, our logical mode of thinking. 
and then we evaluate them all together. So in the first session, everybody is in unison, in creative mode, and in the second session, everybody is in logical mode. And we can assess and filter using the feasibility filter and other means, the things that we can do, um, the things that we should prioritize. So not, not everything will be realistic. Some things will take too much money or too much time. So we identify those things that we can progress with and then build our business development strategy around those best ideas. Maybe just one, maybe three or four, but only the best. The next question then is to come on to how we actually try these innovations and test them in the marketplace. Because with any innovation, there is risk, of course. And we have to be very careful not to risk too much because we don't want to sink the ship. Um, so this is a, a judgment and, and an evaluation that we need to make in business when we innovate. How much effort do we put into it? How much risk do we take? What if it doesn't work? And we have to be mindful of these risks and accept that not every idea will work out in practice. So how do we deal with all these different issues? What we want to do, of course, is to minimize the risk, to try something, and then if it doesn't work, we still exist. We haven't gone bankrupt. Therefore, we need a system whereby we try things um, in a, a logical way. We experiment with the lowest risk but the maximum opportunity for success. And for that, we can turn to the lean startup movement. So in this section, I'm gonna talk about the lean startup and what that means, about lean diversification, and then particularly about the minimum viable product. So the lean startup, Many of you will know the book of the same name, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And this is regarded in many ways as the Bible for Silicon Valley. It was written very much with businesses, um, you know, digital businesses, app developers, software uh, businesses in mind. It comes from that environment, but I think that most of the principles, in fact, probably all of the principles will apply to your business and any other business. He talks about a startup, which is obviously starting from nothing, but the same principles can be used to start up a new development within our business, to start up a new product or a new service. So uh, although it's called startup, I think it's relevant to existing businesses that are developing innovations. So what does the, uh, the Lean Startup talk about? There are some key concepts that you'll be familiar with. The idea is that we try something with minimal risk and therefore we put out a prototype and we see if there is any traction. So the word traction is a key word here. Traction means connection or contact or some kind of feedback. And what we're looking for is to see if there is any interest at all with the marketplace, in the marketplace for our product. So ideally, it means people buying from us, paying money because they like the product. That's fantastic traction. But even if somebody um, experiments or downloads an app or inquires about your new service or says it looks good, can they have more information? This is a demonstration of interest, which gives us some hope and some evidence that there is um, some use and value for our innovation. So traction is what we're looking for. And traction is a key word within the vocabulary and the, the methodology of the Lean Startup. 
The second word which we use a lot and has become quite um, prevalent in general terms is the word pivot, which comes from the lean startup movement. And to pivot is to change direction, to change tack, just like a, a, a ship at sea will, or a, certainly an old sailing ship will zigzag. And if the wind changes, it will change direction to catch the wind. So we might need to zigzag. We might need to pivot and change direction according to the feedback that we get. And so pivoting means changing on the basis of evidence or feedback. And we need to be able to do this in an agile manner, to do it quickly, um, to try something different, to see if that works, and maybe change yet again. So pivoting isn't just once, it might mean several iterations, several developments or changes as we react to the traction that we get within um, the innovation. And the third principle um, amongst many within the lean startup is the idea of failing fast. If we're going to fail, if the innovation isn't going to work, let's fail fast before we spend too much time and too much money. And we shouldn't be afraid of failure in this regard because if we are to reduce the risk, we must not continue to work away, um, spending more money and more time on an idea that isn't gonna become reality in the marketplace. So that's why we should fail fast and then develop the next idea. And because we have several ideas, we can give each one uh, in turn, in priority order, uh, a certain amount of resources. If we don't achieve um, the target, you know, the target level of sales or traction or some evidence that we agree in advance, if we don't achieve that, perhaps within weeks or a month or several months, depending on the context, if we don't achieve it, we stop, we fail, we write it off and we move to the next option. So failing fast is very much uh, a part of the, the lean startup movement. So we can use the lean startup methodology in terms of our diversification and our innovations. And by bringing those two ideas together, I would call that lean diversification. In other words, to diversify in the method of the lean startup, looking for traction, being prepared to pivot, and if necessary, failing, failing fast. And a key element of this um, lean startup and lean diversification is the minimum viable product, which I mentioned just briefly a moment ago, but let's look at it in more detail. What do we mean by the minimum viable product? Well, you might call it um, a prototype. You might call it the rough sketch before we do the painting. In other words, it is the minimum that we can produce in order to share it with potential customers. We need something that they can use or look at or engage with. So it has to be real, but not too fancy. That's the point. We don't invest too much too soon in the product or the service because we're not sure if, if it's going to work. So we don't want the full thing, which might cost you know, a lot of money and a lot of time if it's going to even, because it might even fail. But we can't just talk to customers about a vague idea. So the minimum viable product is where the idea meets reality. And we put it out there and we get some, um, we get some traction, hopefully. We get some interest. If we get no interest whatsoever from the market, we drop it, we fail, and we move on. But hopefully we get some traction some sales, ideally, but even without sales, we get interest, we get inquiries, 
we get people using the product for free, perhaps if we have a special offer. And then on the basis of the feedback, we pivot. So what is a minimum viable product? It is the rough and ready first stage product. And I've used it myself. And let me tell you my story in relation to the minimum viable product. Because amongst everything else that I do, such as um, my workshops and speeches at conferences and business coaching directly, I write books. And one of the things I decided to do some years ago was to make some video-based courses or toolkits using my expertise and putting it into a, a framework of a course using videos. But I never did it for different reasons. One reason was because I was busy doing other things. Secondly, it wasn't a, an imperative or a priority for my business at the time. But when lockdown came, I decided it was the time. The other reason I didn't do it before is because I'm a perfectionist. I like things to be perfect. I'm prepared to spend a lot of time writing a book or preparing a, a workshop. And when I started thinking about my video-based courses and toolkits some time ago, um, I got myself worked up about, well, it has to be perfect. I have to use a design studio. I have to use uh, video producers. We have to have uh, invest a lot of money and time in making my video courses perfect. And this actually stopped me from doing it. When it came to the lockdown earlier this year, I decided it was the time to do it because I had some spare time, because my business needed to diversify itself. And I used the idea of the lean startup and lean diversification and the minimum viable product. So I talked to myself and I said, David, this first product does not have to be perfect just create a, a prototype, a minimum viable product, maybe with just three or four videos and some information and some documents and some reading, and then publish it on your website and see what happens. That's all. We're not trying to be perfect, David. We just want to put something out there to see if there is a reaction. And this was really a blessing for me. It was liberating because it gave me a reason not to be perfect, but to just innovate and engage with the, the market. And on the basis of my um, minimum viable products, I got feedback from various people. People were using the, the toolkits and telling me how they could improve. And then I added more resources and time and effort into perfecting um, stage by stage, my different products and toolkits. And so it's, it's a very useful way of moving forward. With some toolkits, I didn't pursue them because there wasn't enough interest. With others, there was a lot of interest and therefore I invested in those. And it really gives you a way to move forward without fear and without perfectionism getting in the way. So that's what we can do with the minimum viable product. And we can apply that in all kinds of businesses, uh, certainly in the creative industries and digital industries, but of course, in every other field of human endeavor. And we see that businesses all around the world in every sector are trying new things. Some things will work, some won't. And what we need to do is experiment, innovate, using our creativity, with the minimum viable product because it reduces the risk and it adds to um, the, the, uh, the chances of finding the products or services that will bring us more money, um, perhaps in the short term or maybe even in the long term. And the interesting thing is that sometimes this diversification is a short term fix an emergency measure to um, just to make some money while the main business is closed down. 
But sometimes businesses are finding that they can build a totally new business around these diversified products. So sometimes temporary and sometimes permanent. So in conclusion, I would like to say that we can use creativity and innovation um, using uh, A creativity in the studio and I creativity in the business office. We can use our creativity to uh, think up new ideas. Then we can uh, use the COVID-19 diversification metrics to help us think of ideas, but also to map them out. We can select them, choosing the best ones using the feasibility filter. And then when we decide to invest in a new product or service, we can use the minimum viable product approach. So that's um, the essence of my presentation. I have a lot more to say, but perhaps it will come out in the questions and I'm looking forward to a discussion with you. And don't forget that there's a lot more information on my website, which is davidparish.com, but there's a special page on my website with information relating to this talk, uh, with extra information, links to free resources, and details of my toolkit, which is COVID-19 business strategies, creativity, diversification, and transformation. There are some special offers of discounts and I'm offering 10 free passes to access the toolkit to um, 10 businesses who are listening today. If you want to email me then and explain in a sentence or two why it would be useful to you, then for the first 10 who do that, I can send a, a free pass, a coupon, so that you can access my toolkit. And I'll put the details in here. Um, here we go. 10 free passes, and you email me at david at davidparish.com. So at this point, I will stop talking. And, and I look forward to the questions that you might have um, and so that we can continue the discussion. Thank you for listening and let's talk. Thank you very much, David, for a very insightful talk. Um, I can see that on our YouTube chat, we have some, uh, some comments and one question for the moment. So the question would be, um, what are your preferred testing methods for an MVP? Well, it's a good question. I think the, you know, the, the whole idea of an MVP is, is a testing. It is a te testing method in itself. So it then depends on the context. And perhaps uh, if you want to add to the question um, something Um, sorry about that. Um, if you want to add to the question something about the context, I might be able to answer it more precisely. Um, so it depends. That, that's the point. I think um, for me, with my products, I, um, I develop them minimally. I produce some videos, put them on my website, and then I emailed my contacts, people I already knew, to ask for their feedback. Um, and then that was the easiest thing to do. And I got some immediate, very useful feedback. So I changed things, I pivoted. And then I started to move out more into social media and got more engagement with a, a more general audience. And at that point, you know, there were sales uh, and more feedback so that I could develop it, uh, develop the products further. Um, generally, you know, it's about talking with customers. It's about listening to people. So I think all the methods that you might think of or choose would be uh, about talking to customers. And if I was working with you and your business as a consultant, and you asked me about methods for the MVP, I would say, you know, what are our ideas? Which are the best ideas? which ones shall we test first? And then how shall we test them? We have to produce something, whether it's a service or a product, 
um, that people can use, even for free at first. And then we, we decide who to test it with. And usually that will be our existing customers. Do they want this new product? Because we already have a relationship with them. We already know them, they know us. And it's easier, of course, to engage and discuss things with people we already know rather than total strangers. So the whole of the idea of the minimum viable product is a testing method. We have to have something to test with. We have to have an audience to, to ask. And we do that in relation to the specific circumstances of our own businesses. And then from the feedback we develop, we might choose to fail. And you know, if we get no reaction or no positive reaction, um, or more likely, we uh, pivot and develop the product in accordance with the, uh, the feedback we're getting from the people we're talking with. So I realize that's quite general, but um, if you give me more specific questions, I can ask, answer in more specific ways. I hope that was useful. Thank you, David. Uh, and, the, and the person who asked the question, thanks you also. I can see that we have another question. What is the best methodology for testing and validating a digital product in terms of designs and so on? Well, again, uh, everything we've said applies to digital products. Um, so it might be an app, for example, um, or um, an ebook or a video. I think, again, the pr same principles apply. What is the minimum we can offer in order to start a conversation? That, that's the question. And then the second question is, with whom do we have that conversation? Who, who is most likely to respond? Because we already have a relationship with them, perhaps, or because the, the digital product is designed for them. So let me give you, um, you know, a story, a fictional story, actually, but I think it illustrates the point about a digital product. And in this case, in this case, it's an app. So you can imagine a small company who produce apps. They have an idea that they will produce um, a weather forecasting app, uh, especially for mountaineers, because they are enthusiastic about mountaineering. They have a lot of contacts in the mountaineering world. And they think there is a, uh, an opportunity to diversify by developing a, an app, a weather forecasting app for mountaineers. So they produce something which is good enough for people to download and to use. It's really not very good, but it's good enough. That's the key. It's good enough to start a conversation. And they also put it out on social media and they announce it to other people, um, perhaps on their website, depending on the, what opportunities they have. And what they find is that mountaineers are just not interested. They don't get any feedback or traction from mountaineers. And this is very puzzling and very upsetting, actually. Um, but strangely, they start to get inquiries and good feedback from gardeners. And to their surprise, gardeners start to uh, download the app and to use it for weather forecasting. And so at this point, they decide to pivot. They say, forget the mountaineers, they're not interested, but let's talk to gardeners. And so they start dialogues, digital dialogues anyway, through messaging, through social media, with the gardeners and say, what do you like about it? Why is it so good? Why does it work for you? And what can we do next? And through this conversation with gardeners, they develop the product further, they get more downloads, maybe for free, and then they get income from the, the pro app when they develop it. So they've moved from their initial uh, target market of mountaineers and pivoted towards gardeners because that's where they found some interest. So everything I've said applies to digital products as well as to physical products and indeed to services. So the general principles apply 
We just need to find the most appropriate and relevant ways to start a conversation with a minimum viable product and then to get feedback from our potential customers. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, you have more questions. Um, the following question is, when should I move forward from an MVP to the next step to launch a product? What is the next step to follow? Well, uh, again, it's a good question. And I think we do it stage by stage, little by little. I don't think um, it is not one moment when we decide to move from uh, an MVP to the perfect product. Um, that would be a big step, you know, to say we have a, a MVP, we have some traction, we think it's okay, now let's invest a million euros. You know, that's a big risk, that's, that's scary. So I think we have to do it step by step. And that is a more cautious and low risk approach. So we say that if we get a thousand downloads, um, then we will um, add new features. If we add new features and we get 10,000 downloads, then we will develop a pro app or the next uh, version. And so I think it's a gradual um, stage by stage iter iterative uh, process. Um, I don't think it's one moment when we say, yes, this is definitely going to work. Let's invest a million euros. I think we, we do it stage by stage. We follow the market um, and we invest when there is more chance of getting more feedback and more income. So it's a gradual, smooth process. It's an evolution, not a revolution. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I was talking alone. I was thanking you for all the insightful answers and for the, for the whole the talk. I, I hope everyone will take advantage of this knowledge and they will contact you to get access to the, to the toolkit to ask you questions regarding their businesses. Uh, at the moment, we do not have more questions. So now we don't hear you. <laughs> oh, well done I, touché um, yeah I, I would just say that this particular talk about you know diversification and innovation is is just one part of designing your creative business um, within all of creative industries we need to be smart with our strategies um, we need to think about business constantly so we're working in our studios on our fashion designs and our music and industrial designs, et cetera. But we need to be constantly aware of the changing environment. And of course, with COVID, the, the environment has changed uh, very rapidly outside, you know, in the world, the business environment I'm talking about, as well as other aspects of, of the environment. So we need to be, um, we need to be smart with our business formula. And I wrote an article um, called Create Your Own Business Formula. It's a short article. It was originally written as a chapter in a book. And this brings together three dimensions of, um, of business. It's about your passion and your creativity. It's about your competitive advantage, which is... Um, understanding what you can do that other people can't, which might not be your best thing, but it's something where you excel in relation to the competition. So it's an important point and I talk about it frequently. Um, sometimes you might be very good at something, but if everybody else is equally good or even better, you don't have competitive advantage, you can't win. On the other hand, you might say we can also do this with our creativity, but we're not really so good. Well, you know, that doesn't matter if everybody else is even worse than you. 
because then you have competitive advantage. So it's an interesting concept and I've written a lot about it on my website, in my videos and indeed in my toolkits. So um, have a look at the videos. And the third element is to choose your customers very carefully. Um, not all customers are good customers. And there is a danger because we have access to social media that we try to sell to everybody. We put posts out, you know, millions of posts on Instagram and Facebook and everywhere else, hoping that somebody will buy. But actually, it's much better to be strategic about uh, your marketing and to understand which markets are most likely to respond and then focus all our attention onto that. So this is something um, I can refer you to on my website. When we talk about focusing on the right markets, um, this is my book, uh, Chase One Rabbit, Strategic Marketing for Business Success. And the title comes from a Chinese proverb, which says, if you chase two rabbits, both will escape. So really it's about focus. And it's a book about marketing, especially for creative people. And <clears throat> it was mentioned in the uh, introduction and you will see it on my website. And secondly, also on the page uh, for this event, there is a, a link to the article called Create Your Own Business Formula. And that's already been translated into several languages, including Italian and Spanish and Thai and uh, Indonesian and many other languages. So you, you, there's no reason not to download it and it's also free. So please use the free resources on my website and I'll stop by saying, look at the links on the page we've distributed, we've given you the link to, and um, I wish you every success with your creative enterprises.